this is a lecture on data visualization. I've given it a whole bunch of times. And so I thought I'd go ahead and record it. The, I haven't given this lecture very recently. You can see the slides here are from 2018. Um, but note that the, I've put the slides in the public domain, so feel free to make use of them in any way you want. You can find the source on GitHub. Um, and feel free to contact me. You can find my contact details on my webpage, or you can find me on Twitter. I'm going to focus mostly on graphs, uh, a little bit at the end about tables. The, our goal is to display data well. And I'm going to focus really on principles. And what I view the key principles to be is that you be accurate and clear and that you let the data speak. Really, I mean, you show as much information as possible. There's a trade-off. So show as much information as possible, but not so dense with information that you obscure the, the central message. And I'm, I'm really thinking here about science and not sales. Um, and so, and so I emphasize that you should avoid unnecessary frills, particularly gratuitous uh, three-dimensional rendering of your data, which often gets in the way of um, your ability to, to, to view the message. And in tables, as we'll see, every digit should be meaningful and don't drop ending zeros. So throughout, I'll... Um, expand on and try to illustrate these, these main principles. And really the, the first main principle is show the data. So this, the graph on the left um, is a comparison and response between two treatment groups. There are eight measurements in each group and the, the graph, this graph on the left shows the eight actual measurements in each group, along with the, the two averages and some measure of uncertainty. Very commonly, we'll instead see these sort of data rendered as a bar chart, maybe with little antennas sticking up. Um, here, the data is reduced to just the means, the average in the two groups, and that measure of uncertainty. Very often, also, we um, will see the graph a graph like this, a bar chart with no expression of uncertainty. So rather than showing the actual data, which is perfectly possible when you have a small number of measurements in each group, here it's just reduced to two numbers. And, um, I think you, you often also see such bar charts rendered in three dimensions. Um, you know, back in the 90s, this looked really cool. Um, and so it became relatively common. It's super easy to do in Excel. And the, the default in Excel is to not only is when rendering the bar chart in 3D is to have it projected in front of the um, y-axis scale. So this chart on the right is showing just two numbers, the average in the two groups, but it's difficult to tell what those two numbers are because you have to project back from the height of the bar to where it hits at the, you know, the, the Y axis, which is, you know, offset. Um, so, I, you know, for this principle of show the data, the graph on the right has really um, failed in that it's reduced the data to two numbers and made it difficult to see what those two numbers are. With Excel, you can always um, do worse in a way. Um, it's easy to render this graph as two pyramids, um, you know, add a bit of color You've now, you've reduced the data to two numbers and it's really difficult to tell what those two numbers are. When I first showed this, when I first gave this lecture and showed this chart on the right with the pyramids, I think the students really felt like this was absurd, never would be used. Um, you know, purely theoretical, bad display of data. But in fact, I've seen this in posters. 
um, say showing, you know, something to do with needles or vaccinations where the pyramids look kind of needle-like. So the data were rendered in this way. But not only are these pyramids projected in front of the y-axis scale, but it's, I mean, it's just really difficult to say what those two numbers are in this case. But Excel being really the pinnacle of the bad display of data, um, you can do even better than that by rotating the graph and looking down at these pyramids from above. So um, you can always make it, but, I mean, this, this, I hope, is absurd and would not actually be put in practice. But the key thing is this graph on the left, where you can show the actual data in the two groups. Um, also show the averages and an expression of uncertainty, but don't simply reduce the data to two bars and, even, and really avoid the three-dimensional rendering of those bars, which makes it more difficult to see what the bars are actually showing. Second main principle for me of data visualization is avoid by, uh, pie charts. Avoid pie charts. Um, <laughs> these are some old, old data on internet browser usages. Uh, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari. The, um, the chart on the left is pretty pedestrian, shows the... Um, relative frequencies of the, you know, the usage percentages of the, of the different browsers. The, the chart on the right, that is maybe probably, is maybe the most common um, chart used for these kinds of data. It the, the pie chart has the advantage that um, it makes it clear that these values add up to 100%. I would say that's the only advantage. The main difficulty with these pie charts is that humans are notoriously bad at measuring areas. And so um, it's difficult to gauge the relative sizes of the this section for Internet Explorer and that for Firefox. You can, you know, if you look at the angle, it helps a lot, but really the you know, very often with pie charts, you see the actual values shown 20%, 26%, 44%. And I think that's an admission that the pie chart, I mean, that humans can't read it, that we are showing the actual data alongside the visualization of the data is kind of a confession that no one can really tell what is the number that corresponds to this light blue segment for Chrome. Of course, you know, rendering this in 3D, you know, looked really great in 1997, um, but makes it even more difficult to judge the relative sizes of the different sections. You know, and split them apart, you know, completely gratuitous, not worth anything if, you know, if you actually care about showing what these values are, um, don't use a pie chart, don't use a 3D pie chart, use a bar chart like this, that while pedestrian allows people to see the relative sizes of the values. To, to emphasize this again, um, here are two pie charts with five different sections. Um, can you tell which section is bigger? What are the relative, you know, they all look about the same, I guess. Putting it in 3D and splitting them apart doesn't help. Um, the same information shown as a bar chart, you can immediately see that in this case, E is a bit bigger than D and A is the smallest. Um, and quite a different pattern of differences on the right. Um, the pie chart, you really, we have no ability to distinguish the sizes of those segments. It's made impossible um, by rendering it in 3D, whereas a bar chart, um, while um, you know, not as nice to look at, I guess, um, does a much better job of showing what those actual numbers are and allowing you to see the relative sizes of the, of the five numbers. You know, it, 
just you you look at these differences in the bar in the the bar chart, which is which are very clear. You can't see anything like that in the pie chart unless you are some um, have some superhuman ability. Third major principle is to consider taking logs. Log scales are hugely valuable, especially when responses are over several orders of magnitude. So here again, we have a treatment group, a control group, you know, 10 or so values in each group. Um, but the responses vary um, over many orders of magnitude from values around 0.1 to values around 10,000. By taking logs and showing the response on the log scale, you can, you can really see what's going on in each group and see the differences. If instead you show it on the ordinary scale, all of the values below 100 really get compressed way down to the bottom. And so the, the plot is dominated by the two large values in the control group. You don't really see what's going on in comparing the treatment and control group other than that, there are two large values in the control group. When you have values, um, responses that over many orders of magnitude, things like cytokines, gene expression, those sorts of measurements, it's, you, you almost always want to take logs. You know, just taking the average in the two groups on the original scale and plotting those as a bar, as a bar chart, I think you'll see is um, gives a really distorted view of what's going on in these data. You know, putting that in 3D doesn't help. <laughs> Another example where you want, I mean, where you want to take logs is, is for gene expression data. This is data on two replicate micro, microarrays for gene expression, um, kind of old microarrays that, you know, two replicates of the same sample just to show that the results were similar um, to, you know, to study the kind of technical variation in the assay. So each dot here is one gene and showing the expression of that gene, the level of mRNA in the sample um, in replicate one and replicate two. Um, not taking logs, the, the, the 45 degree line kind of got in the way of most of the data. And actually, you know, there's supposed to be 20,000 points here, but in fact, 50% of the data is below this pink line. And 99% of the data is below this light blue line. You know, the vast majority of data is compressed into a little teeny dot down near zero. Um, gene expression, lots of other kinds of biological measurements have um, ranges, range over many orders of magnitude. And in those cases, you want to take logs. The same data, taking the log of replicate one, the log of repl replicate two, plotting those against each other. Now we can kind of see the data again. And I'm a big proponent of log base two. Um, I like log base two rather than log base 10 because getting back and forth between log and not log is, is just as easy because you can, you know, two, four, eight, 16, 32, you know, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. You can make multiples of, of two pretty easy. Um, and they come much closer together than log base 10. I, I really like log base too. I recommend it to you. But taking logs of any, any base um, solves the problem of um, having data over many orders of, orders of magnitude um, and having it really spread out so you can see the whole see the whole range of the data, the whole dynamic range of the data. But also I would say, you know, in this plot, because we're trying to make a comparison between the two replicates, rather than just plot the two against each other, you really should plot the differences against the averages. Um, let's go back one. You make this sort of plot, we're asking how is replicate one different from replicate two, then everybody kind of rotates their head 45 degrees to look at what are the differences along what you know what points are off that diagonal line 
rather than make everybody in the room rotate their head 45 degrees, it's better to just directly take the differences or equivalently, since we've taken logs, take the ratio and then take the logs, the, the differences between the log values or the log of the ratio or the same thing. So now the, the values that are off the diagonal are, have become the, you know, the values that are vertical differences. My point here is if you're interested in differences, then take differences and look at those directly. So and this is a, a commonly used plot with, with gene expression data um, with replicates was to take, um, or you know, comparing treatment and control was to directly compare, take the difference or the, the log of the ratio treatment versus control and plot that. And it both makes it so that we don't have to rotate our head 45 degrees, so um, relieve some strain on the neck, but also makes more use of the figure. You, um, you can see that we have less um, blank space in this figure than in the previous one. There's another example of the take logs um, principle. I show you a picture of a figure from a what was one of my very first scientific papers. Um, and that this is a case of a ratio. So e each each panel here is a chromosome and it's showing something like the the relative recombin meiotic recombination rate between females versus males. So one, the, the dotted line is at one where the recombination rate in males and females is the same. Um, values above one are the cases where the female is bigger than the male recombination rate and values below one are cases where the male is bigger than the, the female rate. When you take ratios, you almost always wanna look at log ratios and not the ratios directly. And the main, the main problem with this figure is, is it overemphasizes the regions where female is bigger than male. The values above one, uh, where the ratio is above one, it goes from one up to infinity. Whereas the values below one, you know, the, the areas where male is bigger than female is all sort of squished between one and zero. And actually the, the, at the ends of the chromosome, this ratio goes well below one. It goes as far below one as the values go above one in a way. If I took log ratio, it would, um, we'd still see that um, female is bigger than male in most, for most of most chromosomes, but we'd see that at the telomeres, these values go um, very far below one. So if your data, spans many orders of magnitude, you usually want to take logs. Gene expression, cytokines, protein levels, take logs. If um, you're plotting a ratio of two things, you almost always want to take log ratio because it gives equal balance between values above one and values below one. If I'd taken logs, then this would have been a better picture. The next major principle is to ease comparisons by putting the things to be compared next to each other. So this is data on um, male and female mice um, with three different genotypes, homozygous A, heterozygous, homozygous B, and the average phenotype for each of these, for each of these six groups females and males with this genotype, females and males with that genotype. Um, the, the panel on the right is the same data, just rearranged so that um, the genotypes are next to each other, whereas here the, the male and female are next to each other. Both of these figures are um, equally useful, uh, but useful, maybe for different reasons. If we're most interested in the sex difference in, in the trait, we would, we would prefer the figure on the left where female and male are right next to each other and it's easier to make the comparison female to male. If we're most interested in the genotype differences, 
then the figure, the panel on the right is it would be preferred. Um, that the, you know, seeing the comparison between the three genotypes within the female mice and then within the male mice um, be easier when they're next to each other. And often when I'm looking at these kinds of data, I'll make most, I'll make both of these figures and look at both of them um, because they they serve different purposes in a way. I mean, the same information is seen as both, but it's easier to see the sex differences in the figure on the left because they're right next to each other. It's easier to see the genotype differences in the figure on the right because they're right next to each other. Um, and really, most of the time with data visualization, the choice you need to make some choices about what comparisons are most important and based on those choices of what you think is most important that's where you make choices about um, the visualization to ease the comparisons that are most important here i'm emphasizing put the things that you want to compare next to each other um, I, another way to ease comparisons is to to highlight the common values with color. Um, so here using you know, a pink color for one sex and a blue color for the other sex allows you to, um, helps you to you know, pull those out more easily. I look at this now and um, well, there's a, an important question here, whether it, about the choice of colors when you're talking about mouse sex, you know, the choice of colors I've made here, pink for females and blue for males is um, kind of the stereotypical one. And, but it's, I think, not a stereotype that we want to reinforce. And even that um, using that stereotype can be helpful for, I mean, you know, like if we were to switch the two colors here, that would be um, harder to follow for most people because we have that stereotype in the back of our mind. On the other hand, now I would say, don't do this. Don't pick the colors that match the um, our stereotypes. Don't reinforce those stereotypes. Better to pick two totally different colors. Um, pick orange for female, green for, or, you know, purple for male, green for female, something like that. That is, you know, two colors that you can, that you can easily differentiate, um, but that don't have any particular um, value associated with them. Well, it's important in a data visualization to think about what comparisons are most important to make and to make those comparisons easier by putting the things you want to compare as close together as possible um, next to each other where you can and um, highlighting common values, you know, values in a common um, group with color in some way. If you think, you think about, um, different ways of displaying a, a quantitative value, uh, um, displaying a couple of quantitative values. And if we wanna compare the value of A to the value of B, using the height of two bars that are right next to each other versus the height of two bars that are um, offset a little bit with some other stuff going on in between, the height of two bars that are smashed at the bottom of a stacked bar chart, the height of two bars that are, you know, in different spots in a, in a stacked bar chart or right on top of each other in a stacked bar chart, or the, you know, rendered as um, segments in a pie chart. I think, I think it's pretty um, compelling to say that, the figure in the top left of heights of bars is the easiest that are right next to each other is the makes these two values the easiest to compare. Offset a little bit is a little bit harder. Smash down, offset, um, 
those are all making things harder. And the, the comparing two values in, of segments in a pie chart is the hardest one. And because of that, in trying to you know, like, you know, offer this up to the reader um, to make these kinds of comparisons, the comparisons that you want, that the comparisons that are most important to you, you should use heights of bars right next to each other or you know positions of things the positions of the heights of the bars are going to be the easiest thing to compare next our next major principle is to not distort the quantities so this this is a depiction of the sizes of the wheat human and arabidopsis genomes Arabidopsis is a, a model plant. It looks like a weed to me, but um, very important in for biologists. So the the here the the radius of these circles is proportional to the genome size. So they're using circles to compare the the wheat to the human to Arabidopsis genomes um, using the radius that makes the wheat genome look vastly much larger than the human genome, which is itself much larger than the Arabidopsis genome. But this is really a distortion of these quantities because when you look at this circle, which is so big, it doesn't even fit on my slide, um, you're naturally thinking of the area of that circle and not its radius. Uh, if you use circles, the sizes of circles, as um, your way of, of depicting numbers, you really need to focus on the areas and not the radius. So here the area of the circle is proportional to the um, genome size of wheat, of human, of Arabidopsis. And this is a more reasonable, less you know, non-distorted depiction of these data. The human genome is, you know, a fifth as large as the wheat genome. So you we should be able to, to fit about five of these pink circles inside this yellow circle. The human genome is about, um, what, 20 times larger than the Arabidopsis genome. We can somehow fit 20 of these um, green circles inside this pink one. Doesn't look quite right. I mean, can we fit five of these in there and 20 of these in there? I can't really tell because I'm not very good at judging areas. Um, really, <laughs> it would be much better to show these data as a bar chart um, the relative height where we're apodopsis to human to wheat, this to me is the most effective way to show the relative sizes of these three genomes is not with areas of circles, but with heights of bars. I admit that this is much more pedestrian, not nearly as interesting as showing the circles. Um, but it, you know, this is just completely wrong. Because if you're gonna show, if you're gonna use the size of circles to represent numbers, you have to focus on the area because the viewer would definitely will. And this is just vastly distorted um, view of the relative size of the of seventeen to three and three to to point one five. Should point out here that um, oops. Should point out here that. I'm using colors that are kind of fitting with a caricature of, you know, sort of wheat color and sort of Arabidopsis kind of green plant colored and human kind of pink fleshy thing color. Um, th this I think is, you know, worthwhile, effective use of um, colors that kind of match the things that you're, you're graphing. Um, cause it's not, um, reinforcing some stereotype that we don't want to see reinforced really humans are pink fleshy bits, but in, you know, in, in graphing data, you are encoding 
uh, numeric values qual or qualitative values categories as um, as um, graphical objects. And you have a various various ways of encoding the data as the graphical objects. For quantities, you can use positions of things, the links of things, angles, areas, sort of the amount of light and dark or the amount of some color. And these are of decreasing ability to kind of decode the thing that you've rendered. It's easier to, to compare the relative positions of things than it is to compare the relative lengths of things than it is to, to assess how light or dark um, symbols are. Categories, you can distinguish categories using um, shapes like circles, triangles, squares, different colors, texture. I mean, like, you know, cross hatching kind of thing um, or, you know, widths of lines, that kind of thing. Um, texture maybe is also dotted lines versus dashed lines versus solid lines. Maybe you call that texture. And these are kind of decreasing ability to really get back to the categories from the, the values. With complex high dimensional data, you will need to make, you'll be encoding a variety of things in a variety of ways. Um, but keep in mind that some, you know, that some choices are easier to get to decode. And those, the, the comparisons that you think are most important you should use, um, you should encode them with things that are higher up on these lists. Another way to ease comparisons is to uh, uh, align graphs. Here, this is the hypothetical data on the heights of women and the heights of men. Um, two histograms of, of women and men. I have the, the men histogram, the, the histogram of men, um, repeated down here, just to sort of point out that um, it's easier to compare this histogram of women to this histogram of men because things are lined up. You can kind of see, um, you know, that from women to men, everything is shifted to the right a little bit. If if I just shown these two histograms, it would be harder to see that shift because you have to kind of think of what is the average here? It's like, you know, 64 and a half, 60, something like that. And what's the average here? You have to kind of picture this in your mind and then spit it back out over here. It's, it's harder to make the comparison um, when they're horizontally in this histogram. Vertically alignment of histograms makes it easier to compare. Or if, if you have multiple panels and you want to make comparisons between the, uh, the y-axis of those panels, then you want those y-axis to, to line up. Here we have comp you know, a couple panels where we are trying to compare things in their x-axis. We want their x-axis to line up. Um, a second version of this, so the, you know, the panels on the right, I have them lined up vertically and they're, you notice they're using the same x-axis. Whereas the panels on the left, I have them, you know, they're on top of each other, but they're using kind of more the natural scale for the x-axis. The x-axis aren't lined up. 75 is about at the same spot, but 55 over here and there's 60 over here. It's much easier to compare these two panels that are using a common, using common axes than it is to compare these two panels where you, you have to kind of bring the values here into your mind and then imagine what they would look like with that axis scale. So when you, when you have data in multiple panels, ease comparisons between the panels by lining, lining up the axes to be compared either vertically or horizontally if they were sitting the other way and use a common axis, use common axes, sca axis scales so that you can kind of directly compare them and you don't have to kind of rescale them in your mind. Another, another useful principle is to use labels, not legends. Um, here's a graph of the famous iris data, petal length, petal width for 
uh, three different um, kinds of iris flowers. In the, the, the graph on the, the panel on the left, blue, green, pink, you have to look at the scale up here to see what, which one's blue, which one's green, which one's pink. Much easier is to put those labels directly in the graph. Um, there's some ways to have this be automated. In many cases, you know, for a published graph, you want to just like go in there and hand place those text labels. But for graphs that you really care about, it's much better to put these labels directly on the graph next to the clusters that they're labeling than to have a separate legend like this. Also, with this legend, I would have put the pink on the top and the blue on the bottom corresponding to the values here. Because here, the, I mean, the, to make it easier to make the connection between the, the three clusters and the values in this label, I mean, the labels in the legend. Now, the commonly seen in scientific papers and is, is to just have no legend at all and have the caption of the figure explain that blue is this, green is this, pink is that. And that I really don't like. Um, much better to, to show it directly in the graph. And, and really, I emphasize, it's really hugely useful to put these labels directly on the chart next to the things that they're labeling. Right? Um, so you don't you just see it directly. You don't have to do any kind of decoding from what one's pink and what one's green and what one's blue. Another major principle is don't sort alphabetically. Basically never sort alphabetically. Alphabetically is almost never useful. These are some really old data on healthcare spending as a percent of GDP for different countries. In the, the panel on the left, um, the, the countries are sorted alphabetically. That has the, va the advantage that you, if you are thinking, you know, what does Norway look like? It's easier to find Norway on this graph. It has no other value whatsoever and really has no value whatsoever. If you wanna find Norway, you can just poke through here pretty rapidly and find Norway. There it is. Um, it's much better to never sort alphabetically, sort by some value of interest, like sort by the value of healthcare spending, put lowest to highest. This has the advantage then that you can start to see some um, patterns in these data. Like if you look from the top going down, United States, Netherlands, France, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, I mean, you can really see that these are European countries at the top. Um, Indonesia, India, China, Mexico, you can, you can see, um, you know, which countries are low and which countries are high, which is just really hard to pick out here. I guess you can see Indonesia, India, China here are low, United States is high, and you can kind of go, you know, pick, well, don't sort alphabetically, never sort alphabetically, always sort by some value of interest, like sort from low to high. Um, I also point out, I really like these dot charts rather than um, bar charts because they, and, and this is, I think, a really useful replacement for a table. Um, can you, because you can see the labels really well. You can see, um, you can see the quantities quite well here and it, it doesn't take up much more space than a, than a table would. With bar charts, there's this always this question of must you include zero? And I would say for a bar chart, the answer is yes, you must include zero. If you're rendering your values by the height of a bar, that height needs to go all the way down to zero. There's no other option. If you're going to use the height of a bar, the bar needs to be um, go all the way down to zero. It, but in many cases, like here, we're looking at some detection rate that are values that are very close to 100%. And by making this as bar charts uh, um, that go all the way down to zero, it's really kind of hard to distinguish these values. And that's why um, the numbers were shown alongside them, which 
I always feel like is an admission of failure in the data visualization if you have to show the data as well. Um, on, the, on, the, on the right, rather than showing bars, we use these, um, you know, a line segment drawn at the values. And this also makes it easier to show, you know, some measure of uncertainty. And because we're just showing line segments, you know, position is the thing that we're using to um, encode the data, then, then we don't need to go all the way down to zero. Just to some extent, this depends on your audience, but for a scientific audience, looking at something like a detection rate that you want to be high and near 100%, it's better to really focus on the region of interest near 100% and, and not have to go all the way down to zero, which really kind of makes the graph um, less effective in showing the differences between the detection rate of the three methods. Another failure in the figure on the left, in my opinion, is that we're looking at a detection rate, some value that's between zero and 100, and the, the y-axis scale goes to 120. I mean, like it's not, detection rate is not meaningful beyond 100. So I think that the y-axis scale really should be truncated at 100, not allowed to go over. This was done, I think, to give some space for these um, numbers but it's not worth it. You should, um, yeah. But must you include zero? If you're gonna render thing as bars, you must include zero. But there are lots of cases where you don't wanna include zero. Um, if you wanna focus on the kind of the key differences that are like this, then don't include zero, but also then don't render them as bars. Um, getting near the end here, I wanna, show you, um, this is what I would call a very bad table. It's bad in many ways. Um, it's not the worst possible table, but it's a bad table. It's bad because it, there are way too many numbers here. Um, you know, you can kind of tell these values in this column are around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. You know, why are, the, why are we showing this to five digits? And why are we showing this to five digits? These values are around 22, 29, 69. Like, I'm sure that, you know, two thirds of the numbers on this page are just noise. So don't, you don't need to show all possible digits, just focus on the digits that you really care about. You know, you should have cut this off at the decimal point. We should have cut this off at, you know, one value past the decimal point. You should cut this off at two values past the decimal point, almost surely. And then secondly, um, get those get those decimal points to line up so you can make better comparisons here. And thirdly, we should include ending zeros. If, if you cared about this number, 0.38267, then you should care about all the digits of this number, four, four, six, zero, zero. There should be two zeros here. The extra zeros, um, because ending zeros are just as important as ending non-zeros. And it also makes it possible for you to line up those decimal points more easily. But, you know, really, um, there should be a zero on this one, but then all these other ones, we should be cutting away most of the numbers. This is a table from the Journal of the American Statistical Association. Um, it's the American Statistical Association is, has a long history of bad depictions of data, bad um, failing to make figures, but instead making tables and making really bad tables like this. This is a, the better version of that table. Um, get rid of most of the digits, just focus on the ones that matter and include the ending zeros when you need to and get those decimal points lined up. Another example of a bad table is um, just chosen at, um, basically at random from the Lancet from you know, a number of years ago. These are data on, um, Um, incidences, prevalence, 
of um, mortality rate in high, low, middle income countries in different years. There's, there's so much wrong with this table. Um, let's blow up a little segment of it. Um, one part that, you know, this again is showing way too many numbers. You know, here, this is a, you know, the, an estimated rate daily's lost, estimated rate of mortality um, with a confidence interval next to it. The confidence interval is going from 54.12 to 64.27. I mean, if the confidence interval is going from 54 to 64, do we really need those endpoints that precisely? And it's pretty much saying that, you know, these two digits are meaningless. So don't show them. There are too many digits here. Um, you know, also that, the, but the, the, oops, sorry. The bigger problem with this table is that I think the, the key things we're trying to compare are like the rate over time, the rate in 1990 to the rate in 2005 to the rate in 2010. And these are the things that you want to compare are really far apart. Hard to, hard to make comparisons. I don't, it's hard to make comparisons horizontally in tables. It's much easier to make comparisons vertically. Um, but also, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in between that's hard to see. If you wanted to make comparisons between, um, you know, well, I mean, that's kind of the key thing. The key comparisons are really far apart. Arrange for the, the arrangement of this, the things you want to compare are nowhere near each other. So this table, there's way too many digits. The numbers aren't aligned as they should be. The numbers to be compared aren't anywhere near each other. The, the interesting comparisons are horizontal rather than vertical. And you know, it'd be much better if you rendered this as a multi-panel figure rather than as a table. You'd be much better able to make the comparisons you want to make if you did them graphically rather than kind of the digits directly. Okay, one last example. This is a, another old one from the five. 538 blog. It was a, um, a long blog post about um, which state has the worst drivers. It had five panels like this. So this is showing as a bar chart, the, the relative number of non-distracted collisions, the relative number of speeding related collisions, the relative number of um, alcohol impaired collisions. And behind this in the lighter color is the, the total number of collisions as a, as a rate per billion miles traveled. Um, the, you know, the states are arranged alphabetically um, and they, these, it's really hard to make comparisons between these, the, the comparisons you want to try to make are really difficult to make. Like what's the relationship between fatal collisions and by distracted driving, not distracted driving and fatal collisions by speeding. It's hard to tell um, because they're, they're in separate panels and the separate panels were really far apart on this blog, which is one you know really long column. My version of this is to make, um, separate related panels right next to each other, total crashes, non-distracted related crashes, speeding, alcohol. Um, and then they, there were two other columns about average insurance premium by state and average insurance losses by state. Um, well, I've sorted the, the states by the total number of crashes, um, kind of the crashes per billion miles, the states with more crashes I put at the top, the states with fewer crashes I put at the bottom. Um, and then they use that sort for the other columns next to it. So you, you can start to see some real um, patterns emerging, like, you know, the, the second panel here, the, the, the non-distracted crashes is pretty well correlated with total crashes, which you can see because they're going up together. You've sorted on total crashes. You can see non-distracted driving is kind of going up with that. Um, you can see a couple of clear outliers, which were not so obvious in the other figure. In this, the speeding panel, 
alcohol panel, they're also, you know, somewhat correlated. You know, they're sort of going up to the right in both cases. With the speeding, there seems to be kind of two groups, kind of a lower value and a higher value. Um, I, so trying to put all the panels kind of linked to each other next to each other um, and sorting on one value here, here, the total number of crashes is really effective at helping to see the relationship between them. I would also say it's, it's useful here to, to make direct scatter plots um, between, you know, number of non-distracted related crashes and the total crashes. If you're interested in how those two values relate to each other, nothing better than a scatter plot that plots them against each other directly. Here, a plot of the speeding related crashes against total crashes, you know, directly plot them against each other. Um, helps you to see how they're related. And it really pulls out this, you know, lower cluster and the higher cluster of, of states, um, and, and you can really see these two outliers in the non-distracted driving cases. If you're interested in the relationship between two variables, rather than study them carefully in that previous figure, it's best to make the scatter plot. The disadvantage here is that it's harder to see which state is which. Um, one approach is to use an interactive graph. I have an interactive version of this graph. Um, showing those dot plots on the top. Um, and if, if you highlight one of those dots, you it gets highlighted everywhere else. Um, it's interesting that these two outliers in the not distracted crashes are Mississippi and Wisconsin. Wisconsin's the state that I live in. And hard to believe that, um, it, there are real differences between those two states and the other in crashes due, that are not distracted. Um, you got to think instead that they just have a you know a different way of measuring things. You know, similarly here, um, you know the states that have that are in this lower chunk of speeding, speeding related crashes versus other states. And kind of see it more directly in this scatter plot. Speeding related crashes per billion miles, total crashes per billion miles. Um, you know that there's this set of states that are kind of lower than, than you'd expect um, given the overall pattern. North Dakota, um, Arizona, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Um, Kansas, Florida, New Mexico, Mississippi, et cetera, Iowa, Georgia, you know, that, so that the interactive graph, um, helps you to be able to see the labels in the scatter plots, which is nice and, and kind of pull out, you know, where these points are in the different panels more easily. Um, right. So. In summary, for data visualization, really focusing on science and not sales, I recommend show, show you know, first principles, show the data, avoid chart junk, um, consider taking logs. Um, if your data are over many orders of magnitude, or if you're looking at ratios, I recommend that you take logs. And I'm a big proponent of log base too. If you're interested in differences, then just calculate those differences and, and plot the differences. Um, put the things that you want to be compared next to each other. There's always going to be some judgment there. Um, you're, some trade-off is happening. Um, make, it, um, make a choice. Decide what is most important to compare and, and arrange your graph to make that easier to compare. Use color to set, set things apart, but consider colorblind folks in, in deciding which colors to use. Um, you know, don't use red and green is the biggest thing to emphasize. It's sort of most common um, 
color detection impairment that you want to avoid um, being the important comparison to make. Use position rather than angle or area to represent quantities. Align things vertically, align, align axes to ease comparisons, use common axes limits to ease comparisons between panels. Directly label, put labels directly on your plot rather than have a separate legend or putting the codes in a caption. A sort, you know, states, other categories on some meaningful variable. Don't sort things alphabetically. Never sort things alphabetically in graphs, in tables. Um, must you include zero in the axis limits? If you make a bar chart, you must. But in many cases, you don't want to include zero. You want to focus on the, the, the region of interest. It depends somewhat on your reader. And for exploring relationships, there's nothing better than, than using a scatter plot directly. A lot of people have inspired me in this. Um, Hadley Wickham, Naomi Robbins, Howard Weiner, Andrew Gelman, Dan Carr, Edward Tufte. Um, yeah, I don't have any, I, there are a lot of inspiring people in the world. For the talk that I, the, the slides here, these are the people that were most influential on my, um, what I've chosen to show. There's a lot of other things to read. A lot of things I would recommend reading. Edward Tufte has some great kind of coffee table books that um, I particularly like his first one, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Andrew Gelman and colleagues wrote a nice paper in the American Statistician about um, really how to, in which they show how to turn tables in um, statistical papers into graphs. Uh, to really sort of advocating that we should be making more graphs, not tables. Naomi Robbins has a very nice practical book on creating more effective graphs that I highly recommend to you. The Nature Methods Journal had a series of columns about data visualization that are all collected online um, that are, are very worth reading. And again, these slides are free and you can find them online here and you, you make use of them as you wish. Very good, thanks very much.